In this section, we're going to start digging into the difference between distance vector and link state. Now, we covered this briefly in the previous video, but I wanted to take a deeper dive into the differences between the two uh, between the two different types of routing protocols because it's really, really important that you understand it now so that when you get into CCMP and CCIE later on, if you're into, into uh, that type of thing, you'll be that much better off in the future. So the first thing that I want to start talking about here is the distance vector aspect of things. Now, let's hold here for a moment and start digging into the details of distance vector. Now, the reason why I think this is so vitally important now is simply for the fact that when you start getting into conversations with customers or other engineers, you need to be able to articulate why you would go a certain direction. You know, because either that person may not know it or they may have their own uh, preconceived notations or whatever. Being able to uh, to explain to them why this or that from a technical perspective is going to be huge. So the way that this the way that distance vector works is again distance is how far and vector is which way, right? That's basically what it's saying. Now the difference between these two is this guy uses hop count to determine how it gets to where it's got to go up to a maximum of 15 hops. It doesn't care what the bandwidth is, it doesn't care what the cost of the link is, it doesn't care about anything other than the hop count. So if you're 10 hops away, that's 10 hops. It doesn't matter if you're 10 hops away and it's 100 gigabit or 10 meg. It makes no difference whatsoever to RIP. EIGRP uses a combination of bandwidth and delay. It uses the lowest bandwidth from source to destination and it adds all of the delays of all the links that it must traverse to get to the destination. It adds those together so you get the cumulative or the sum of the bandwidth and then you add these two together this becomes your feasible distance. This is your end-to-end -end cost. Now the drawback to RIP and EIGRP is they work off of a I only know whatever somebody else told me. So the way this basically works is, uh, say I have R1, I have connects to R2, connects to R3. Very simple topology. Well, what's going to end up happening is I have a LAN segment attached to R1 and R3. R1 is going to advertise to R2. I have the, let's say I have the 1 network and I have the 12 network. He's going to say I have the 1 and I have the 12 network. He's going to advertise that to R2. R2 is going to know about the 12 network and the 13 network, because that's what he's connected to here. And then what he's going to do is he's going to advertise that this way. So then now 12 or uh, R1 knows about the 1, 12, and 13 networks. R12 is going to advertise the 1 and 12 networks, as well as the um, the 12 network here. Well, he's already he's already advertising the 12. And R3 is going to be advertising the 2 network and the 13 network. So he's going to be advertising 2 and 13 outbound. So this guy will learn about 2, this guy will learn about 2. So at the end of the day, we'll know how to reach all of our destinations. However, R1 only knows about the 1 network, the 12 network, the 13 network, and the 2 network because R2 told it. If R2 didn't know, R1 wouldn't know. Where this is not how, this is what they are commonly referred to as routing by rumor. You're only told, you only know about what it is that you've been told about. So R1 only knows what R2 told it about. If R3 has this, adds another link, but doesn't advertise it into, into RIP, what's going to end up happening here? or EIGRP for that matter, if he doesn't add this link in here, then R2 never knows about it, then R1 never knows about it. Now, simple solution, advertise the three network in. Well, guess what? Then R2 would know about it, and R1 would know about it. But until you do that, it doesn't know. Now, the way that this works, when we talk about link state with OSPF and ISIS, OSPF is the more commonly well-known protocol. This guy right here is used in the enterprise. 
ISIS is typically used in the service provider. Now, I'm familiar with both of them. We won't get into ISIS at all. We might touch very, very, very lightly on it in CCNP, and we'll have to go into a little bit more depth with ISIS. And the only reason why that is typically necessary for an RNS engineer is because if you get into techniques like ACI, or you get into techniques like Fabric Path, which is pretty much dead, but still out there. Both of them use IS to IS for the underlay uh, for your underlay communication. It's IS IS under the hood. So the uh, that in uh, OTV uh, overlay transport virtualization. So um, although what's interesting is Fabric Path and OTV are both Cisco proprietary. I happen to like VXLAN. And VXLAN does both. So it acts like Fabric Path and it acts like OTB. It's a layer two over layer three communication. So again, way outside the scope for us, but there's a reason why ISIS is important to understand. So when we get into things like OSPF, OSPF and ISIS actually have a link state database. Now, what does that mean? Well, if I take a situation where let's say I have R1, I have R2, I have R3, and I have R4. I connect these guys together via some sort of communication, whether it's uh, fiber optic cable, whether it's Ethernet, whether it's wireless. What it what the transport is is actually completely arbitrary. It makes no difference whatsoever. Let's say I've got the one network over here. I've got the, the four network over here. I've got the 34. I've got the 13. I've got the 12. And I have the 24. Okay, so I have all my networks that I need to communicate with. What's going to end up happening is as soon as there's OSPF or ISIS adjacencies between any of these routers, doesn't matter which protocol it is, what's going to end up happening is R1 is going to have a bunch of, um, is going to advertise the, the, its entire database to R3, R4, R, and R2. They'll all learn it. Now, before they can, before they can converge, each router has to have its own copy of the link state database, and they have to be synchronized. What's going to end up happening is R1 and R3, all routers 1 through 4, are all going to send information back and forth. They're going to sync their link state databases before they do anything else. Once they have synced their databases, then they will start to run through SPF, which is these. They both run the shortest path first algorithm. They run SPF. Now, OSPF and ISIS. So what's going to end up happening is all the routers are going to sync their databases and then they're going to advertise the information that they need to get to the other devices. Now, how OSPF and ISIS actually work, and this is actually the, uh, the interesting part about it, is when you're dealing with OSPF or ISIS, what you're doing is you're not trying to reach the actual prefix that it's advertising because OSPF and ISIS don't actually advertise routes and actually more specifically none of the IGPs actually advertise routes what they actually do is they are when you type in or use the network command or underneath the interface level command you're actually enabling the protocol on those interfaces and sending the protocol hellos out of them that is where you're actually advertising the information so IGP itself is simply advertising topology information. And by that happening, you're able to advertise what you know about. What ends up happening with OSPF and ISIS specifically here is you're not trying to solve the shortest path to the link that you're trying to reach. You're trying to solve the shortest path to the device that advertised that link. So case in point, if R1 was to be able to reach the four network. What he's actually going to do is he's going to solve the shortest path tree to the node or the device that advertised the four network. In this case here, that is going to be R4. R4, therefore, is going to have to solve its shortest path to R1 if it wants to reach the link of R1 or the one network in this case. So R1 is going to figure out the shortest path to get to R4. In this case here, he's going to have two different directions to go in to get there. How he actually gets there will depend on the individual link state that's in place. So this could be a 10 here. This could be a 20 here. 
you always use the value of your outgoing interface of where you're heading to determine your shortest path, cost-based in this particular situation. So if R1 needs to find R4, he's going to have to figure out what the shortest path 3 is in order to reach R4. Once he's determined that, then all he has to do is follow the path to get to R4 that he's pre-calculated. That is how the OSPF, or that is how SPF works. You are, you are always going to solve the shortest path 3 to the device or the node in the graph. If, if you look at it from these four, these four routers are a graph that it takes to, in order to get to the node that advertised the link. Because what you're doing is you're actually doing a what they call a LSA. And with OSPF, it's called an LSA. And what you're doing is you're doing a link state advertisement. You're advertising the state of the link to the routing protocol. Now, that's the general breakdown to how this actually breaks out. So what you're doing is you have an LSA. There's multiple types of LSAs, and we'll cover those in more detail later. But the idea here is once you know which LSA you're trying to get to, you go to, you try to figure out who it is that you need to go through to get to the node that advertised that LSA, and you solve the shortest path three to that. Once you've done that, then you know your shortest path to whatever the destination is you're trying to reach. That is the general breakdown to how OSPF works. So, at the end of the day, that's basically how it, how it boils down. We'll take a look at this in much more detail. I actually have a video planned out to where we're actually going to go through and we're going to build the network without actually having to do like a show IP OSPF interface brief. We're going to use the OSPF database to build a graph. Because if you understand how to build the topology using the OSPF database, you should be really, really good at being able to determine how to forward through the th throughout the network. It's not easy at first, and I will admit that. When I first started learning how to do this, I was completely confused. But after you've done it a couple of times, interpreting how to look at the OSPF database is going to be super beneficial as you move start moving forward, especially in CCNA and CCIE. Or sorry, CCMP and CCIE. So with that being said, that is what I wanted to cover in this video. Until next time, guys, thank you for your time and your patience, and we'll catch you in the next video.